Hong Kong, the most expensive city in the world for expats. A city touted as having everything in the world at a place where everything was once considered possible. Luring foreign investors with tax-friendly policies, for decades it's been competing with Singapore to gain dominance as Asia's best place to do business. And in 2019, Hong Kong had even been ranked the most popular destination in the world for both business and leisure travel. But not anymore. Hong Kong is about to be governed by a law most residents have never seen, and one that many don't agree with. The Chief Executive, the Honorable Mrs. Carrie Lam Cheng Yutmo. On June 30th, China's parliament passed a national security legislation for Hong Kong, setting the stage for the most radical changes to the former British colony's way of life since it returned to the Chinese rule 23 years ago. For over two decades, Hong Kong enjoyed limited self-governance and civil liberties, including an independent judiciary and unrestricted press, while Beijing controlled the city's defense and foreign affairs. But now China's President Xi Jinping has signed a presidential order promulgating the law. Beijing claims it is necessary to deal with separatism and foreign interference, but critics believe it will destroy the autonomy promised when the territory was returned to China. Under the law, Beijing can set up special police units in Hong Kong to punish crimes considered a threat to the mainland with some crimes carrying a penalty of life in jail. Critics have questioned the legal basis on which China proceeded with the legislation, saying it undermines the basic law. Others fear Beijing will use the law to pursue its political opponents and outlaw dissent. The legislation was passed on the eve of the 23rd anniversary of Hong Kong's return to China. There's little doubt that it delivers a crushing blow to pro-democracy protesters. It comes after the protests swept across the city last year and fueled a broad pro-democracy movement. China has not issued a public draft before passing the law, which means a vast majority of people in Hong Kong are confused about what's going on. I never thought that Hong Kong would meet its downfall this soon, especially with the social movement last year and the pandemic this year. We think it's, uh, it's a very obvious that the Hong Kong government has become a puppet of um, the Chinese government and she has no say at all. I'm a little worried. I'm in my 80s, almost 90 years old now, and it is pointless for me to immigrate now, but my children are all gone. So my family is taken away from me, but it can't be helped because the children, the younger generation, need freedom. The United States, Britain, the European Union, Japan and Taiwan are among those who have criticized the legislation. China has hit back at the outcry, denouncing interference in its internal affairs. We stand for rules and obligations, 
and we think that is the soundest base, basis for our international relations. And the enactment and imposition of this national security law constitutes a clear and serious breach of the Sino-British Joint Declaration. It violates Hong Kong's high degree of autonomy and is in direct conflict with Hong Kong basic law. Free Hong Kong was one of the world's most stable, prosperous and dynamic cities. Now, now it will be just another communist run city where its people will be subject to the party elite's whims. It's sad. Indeed, this is already happening. Security forces are already rounding up Hong Kongers for daring to speak and think freely. The rule of law has been eviscerated. And as always, the Chinese Communist Party fears its own people more than anything else. The United States is deeply concerned about the law's sweeping provisions and the safety of everyone living in the territory, including Americans. The new legislation does not conform with Hong Kong's basic law, nor with China's international commitments, both in terms of adoption procedure and inceptance. So uh, we're very clear on that topic. Um, that is for us a very critical and we're very seriously uh, concerned about it. So why has this become a matter of global concern? With more control now given to China, will Hong Kong continue to maintain its status as a financial hub? Is this the beginning of a new and frightening chapter for Hong Kong? Hong Kong police were quick to make their first arrest under the new sweeping national security law. They arrested a man for allegedly holding a flag advocating the territory's independence. He is awaiting trial. Undaunted by all of this, thousands staged a protest on July 1st, the largest show of defiance in Hong Kong this year. Hong Kong police fired water cannons and tear gas on the protesters. More than 300 people were arrested, including 10 on suspicion of violating the new law. Traditionally, July 1st is a day of protests in the city, but this year, for the first time since the handover of Hong Kong in 1997, the police did not give permission to protesters to hold peaceful demonstrations. A stark contrast to a year ago, when tens of thousands of people marched through Hong Kong's streets protesting an extradition bill. A year later, Beijing has got an entry past the firewall that has insulated the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region, or SAR, from the mainland for the last 23 years. It has also distracted the world from its response to the horrifying coronavirus outbreak, which emerged from Wuhan and rapidly spread across the world. Although many questions remain unanswered, by passing this legislation, China's Communist Party has managed to rattle investors, bankers, economists and business leaders across the world. Hong Kong Port Control, understand you now skewed to boy 827. Right? This is the Port of Hong Kong. In a port city founded on trade, it's been the cornerstone of the city's growth. By the early 2000s, Hong Kong became the trade gateway to China, and it became the largest container port in the world. However, in the last decade, it has been slipping down the ranks of the world's top ports for numerous reasons. And now Hong Kong's status as one of the world's most prominent financial hubs appears to be under threat. Experts believe that Hong Kong may now struggle to attract individuals and financial institutions to pump in money in its economy. 
while economically it will be it will be very difficult uh, for the people of Hong Kong, it will, the international trust in Hong Kong is gone. I mean, people will move away to Taiwan, to Singapore, to other places, and and you will see a great dismay. But I think the global shadow it casts on uh, China's own international commitments. I think this is most important, and perhaps people should now recall that the original 1984 agreement signed between uh, then Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher and then Chinese Prime Minister George Young, which was registered in the UN. So this should now perhaps be you know, looked at. I mean, what does it mean if a, if a, if an agreement is registered in the UN and its Senate are not held up? Uh, you know, are not held up by the countries who have committed to it. Uh, I think this this does cast a very difficult um, shadow, and we have to look at it very carefully. In light. The United States has long given the former British colony a special status on trade and other issues. The new law prompted President Trump to declare that he would remove the city's special status under U.S. law. While the details are yet to be finalized, it's safe to assume that Hong Kong will soon face the same U.S. restrictions on trade, travel and extradition, as does the rest of China. In 2019, pro-democracy protests and the political turmoil soured the expat dream, especially for the 90,000 or so people who come from major economies outside Asia. More than 9,000 foreign firms operate in Hong Kong, and the United States has 1,300 companies operating out of the region. Expats in Hong Kong are understandably concerned. The main impact on those companies would be in relation to tariffs. So if tariffs were imposed, then this would have a significant impact because there's about 60, 66 billion US dollars at risk. Now, 50 billion US dollars of that is exports from the United States to Hong Kong. The remainder is exports from Hong Kong to the United States. It's going to impact on the ease of doing business, and that's probably one of the major impacts. In the past, it's very easy for anyone to fly into Hong Kong, fly out of Hong Kong. There's no great visa process that's involved. If US sanctions or US moves increase the need for visas, then that will slow down the ease of doing business in Hong Kong. And anything that slows down the ease of doing business is a negative. However, many of them are supporting the new law too. Last month, Peter Wong, the Asia-Pacific chief executive of HSBC, signed a petition backing the law. The British multinational investment bank said it respects and supports all laws that stabilize Hong Kong's social order. The bank contradicted the British government's opposition to the controversial law, and it drew a sharp rebuke. In relation to HSBC, look, ultimately businesses will uh, make their own judgment calls, but uh, let me just put it this way, we will not sacrifice the people of Hong Kong uh, over the altar of banker bonuses. And we've made a historic commitment to the people of Hong Kong to protect their autonomy um, and to protect their freedoms. And more importantly, so has China. So we will hold them to those responsibilities um, and uh, I'll let business, businesses and banks uh, make their own judgment call. But for us, this is a point of principle and I think it's right we live up to our historic responsibilities and we stick up for the people uh, and stand up for the people of Hong Kong at this very sensitive time. Standard Chartered, another bank that is headquartered in London but makes the bulk of its profits in Asia, has backed China's imposition of a national security law on Hong Kong. Aviva Investors, a major shareholder in both the banks, has hit out at them, saying it was uneasy with their stance. Well, the foreign firms basically uh, you know, have to make a statement in support of the law when they are uh, asked to, and in fact, uh, you know, if they would fail to do so, that could almost be interpreted and perhaps could be interpreted as an offense uh, under the new law. You know, you're asked to support this national security law and you say no, uh, that sounds like, an, you know, an, an endangerment of uh, national security or at least certainly could be uh, interpreted that way. So uh, if asked, uh, clearly they are all going to have to make these kinds of uh, declarations of support of the law. On the first trading day after the new national security laws were imposed, Hong Kong's Hang Seng Index jumped by 1.18%.
The positive reaction in stocks has baffled analysts and traders. While some reason that this reflects investor expectation that the legislation will end protests and bring stability, others believe that mainland Chinese buying was behind some of the gains. Let's not forget that the Chinese Communist Party has a history of ensuring market stability around key events. I think uh, the trade aspect may not be so important because China has been able to move uh, the trade uh, to Shanghai and other places and, and uh, Hong Kong uh, has a smaller proportion, a proportion of China's external trade. But Hong Kong is still the eighth largest trading destination of the world. And Hong Kong, more than this, is the fourth largest stock exchange in the world. And there are many mainland China companies who have come to Hong Kong and registered on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange because it gives them access to the international financial market markets. And after all, the Hong Kong currency is pegged to the US dollar as well. So it gives the Chinese uh, companies a very great advantage to come to Hong Kong and register. And a lot of them have benefited from this. But after this law has been passed, uh, the, the, the security and belief and trust in, in a free and free financial market in Hong Kong will certainly go down. And the people will not then give the same respect to companies who are registered on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. They will not enjoy the same credibility that they have enjoyed so far. So, so I certainly think that as a financial center, Hong Kong's uh, independence uh, will be seriously affected. And because of this, it is the mainland Chinese companies who are registered on the Hong Kong stock market whose, whose future will be affected. Foreign companies, foreign investors, they will think that uh, with the implementation of the new security law, since it's covered so well, then uh, they will uh, exercise prudence when they set up a company. If they set up a very big one, then they consider set up uh, maybe a very small one at the very beginning, they, uh, test the water before they expand the business. Data is the lifeline of any modern economy, and Hong Kong has flourished on this axis. The new law might limit Hong Kong's chance of committing to free data flow arrangements in the future. I would uh, not be surprised to see more censorship of the internet, more blocking of um, overseas websites uh, in Hong Kong, the kind of thing that we now see in mainland China. I don't think it's going to directly flow from this law, but I think the imposition of this law on uh, Hong Kong uh, shows the intention of the mainland government to make Hong Kong very much like a mainland Chinese city. Um, we are seeing really no pushback from the Hong Kong-based uh, government of Hong Kong, that is Hong Kong officials who are high up in the government and particularly, in particular, the chief executive, Kerry Lam. So it is uh, entirely plausible to me that when the instructions come from the mainland to impose more internet censorship, blocking of foreign websites, things like that, that uh, Hong Kong, uh, the Hong Kong local government will comply. Getting Hong Kong to fall in line has been a mission for Chinese leader Xi Jinping. But the speed with which he has imposed this legislation to clamp down on dissent has surprised many. This is where the law will show its true color. The Hong Kong International Airport. The new national security law criminalizes a broad range of actions. It is written in such a way that any criticism of the Chinese Communist Party could plausibly be deemed in violation of the law. So landing in the city could now mean getting sucked into China's dysfunctional legal system. You could be arrested for violating this draconian law. You may never find out what your fault is. The bottom line, if you are opinionated and have criticized China's repression, annexation, provocation or even the Wuhan virus, then traveling to Hong Kong may be risky. In Hong Kong airport, transiting through Hong Kong, uh, you know, then you're subject to Hong Kong law and, uh, you know, you can be arrested there. So the real question is not uh, whether you're there for one hour or four hours or, or, or a month. Uh, the real question is, um, 
uh, you know, have you done something that has sufficiently annoyed the Hong Kong authorities that they would, um, uh, you know, arrest you. But in general, you know, we do not see foreigners being uh, prosecuted in China, um, even pretextually, uh, for having criticized the Chinese government, you know, when they were outside of China. Um, but we're, we're in kind of a new world here. I mean, this uh, national security law is really something quite uh, unexpected in its scope and severity. So uh, in the, you know, in if you'd asked me six months ago, you know, would you get in trouble for criticizing China abroad uh, if you arrived in Hong Kong, I would have said, you know, the answer is no, at least the probability is very small. Um, but it is important to understand that now it is certainly theoretically possible. There is absolutely no legal bar to it. Canada, in a travel advisory, is already warning its nationals of an increased risk of arbitrary detention and possible extradition to mainland China. The United Kingdom also declared an increased risk of detention and deportation for a non-permanent resident in its latest travel advisory for Hong Kong. Australia, too, has updated its travel advisory, warning that the national security law could be interpreted broadly and that visitors can break the law without intending to. Taiwan's government, which just opened an office to assist any Hong Konger who wants to flee, also advised its citizens to avoid unnecessary visits to Hong Kong. India, which has about 22,000 citizens residing in Hong Kong, is also keeping a close watch on the developments. Given the large Indian community that makes the Hong Kong special administrative region of China its home, India has been keeping a close watch on recent developments. We have heard several statements expressing concern on these developments. I think definitely it does cast a direct uh, shadow over the way President Xi Jinping uh, deals with uh, international commitments and international obligation and brings in new obligations. I mean, look at what's happening uh, in, in the talks with India. I mean, the, the demand for Arunachal Pradesh that China is now making was never on the cards. It was never anywhere. And suddenly you raise a demand and then want to talk about it. And similarly, I would say that even in Ladakh, I mean, India has had a border with Tibet all this while. India has never had a border with China. And China overran Tibet just about 70 years ago, a little more than 70 years ago. So on what basis should India be negotiating with China about the border with Tibet? This is a very important question that the people of India and the global community have to ask themselves. Why is this so? Because we have seen what China does in their international commitments and in their negotiations. The law also threatens the freedoms and rights protected by the joint declaration. We made clear, Mr. Speaker, that if China continued down this path, we would reintroduce a new route for those with British national overseas status to enter the UK, granting them limited leave to remain with the ability to live and work in the UK and thereafter to apply for citizenship. And that is precisely what we will do now. <laughs> Prominent Hong Kong pro-democracy activist Nathan Law has said that he has fled the city following the enactment of a new Beijing-sponsored crackdown on free expression. He is not the only one. The UK government has offered those affected a route out of the former UK colony. About 350,000 UK passport holders and 2.6 million others eligible will be able to come to the UK for five years. Meanwhile, Hong Kong pro-democracy activists are discussing a plan to create an unofficial parliament in exile to keep the flame of freedom alive and send a message to China that freedom cannot be crushed. Meet Simon Cheng, a Hong Kong citizen who worked for the UK government for almost two years. He was detained for 15 days on a trip to mainland China in August. 2019, where he alleges that he was beaten and tortured by China's secret police for participating in pro-democracy protests. After being released, he fled to the UK, where he is living as a British overseas national. Now, the UK gives a very good signal, I do believe is quite attractive to most Hong Kong people who have the BNO passport and they are eligible to come. 
But in the future, I do believe that once the other Western countries, including Taiwan, Australia, and United States, once they initiate more libel schemes and more choices to let Hong Kong people to pick and to choose, the shadow parliament is, can send the very clear signals to Beijing and Hong Kong authorities that actually the democracy need not to be based on the mercy of Beijing. The United Kingdom is changing its immigration rules. Eligible individuals from Hong Kong currently can come to the UK for six months without a visa. Under the new policy, they will have the right to live and work in the country for five years. After that, they will be allowed to apply for a settled status and then again for citizenship. Hong Kongers who were born after the end of the British rule in 1997 are not eligible meaning that, in effect, many of the city's young student activists who are most at risk of arrest under the new law cannot take advantage of the British offer. Meanwhile, the Hong Kong government has agreed to pay millions of dollars to a London-based PR firm in a bid to counter coverage of the territory in the international media. The agency, Consulum, has been criticized in the past for representing those that other businesses would not touch. But despite China's best efforts, covering up what's happening in Hong Kong won't be easy. Thank you.